Hat Jesus te Maria. So what we're going to do today is a uh, Christmas special. Obviously, I think uh, it's, it's only right to do this. Uh, okay, so we're going to, in this most wonderful time of the year, we're going to try to look at the most wonderful event in human history, the incarnation of the Son of God. All right, the Christmas story, if there is a story too good to be true, it's Christmas, except with one exception. It is true. It is true. And, you know, our cont contemporary culture can distract us very easily from, you know, the true meaning of Christmas, but, you know, from the supreme truth. But there is one thing that reminds us of the supreme truth, and it has Franciscan roots the crib, the manger, the scene. So that's what we're going to try to look at. So we're going to try to look at the meaning of Christmas from a Franciscan perspective, fundamentally from Franciscan Christocentrism and the Marian mode of the incarnation. And it's divided fundamentally in three parts. So we're going to see the memory of the child born in Bethlehem, so the original uh, event, we're just going to read, you know, what uh, Thomas of Celano wrote, uh, you know, about uh, St. Francis of Assisi, that event at Greccio, very famous. We're going to see Benedict XVI's interpretation of this, and then we're going to go to the Marian dimension. Mary, Christmas. Christmas is Eve. She is the new Eve. And we'll see her role in the incarnation. So what we're doing here is fundamentally easy. We're going from 2017, from 1223, to the actual event, and into the mind of God. So that's, that's the line right there, okay? So let's start with 2017, December our year. So if you go to the Vatican, St. Peter's Square, you'll see this right now. All right? So every year, they have a new scene of the nativity. And this is pretty much, you know, you see this different places as well. And it's a good reminder of the meaning of Christmas. And it has Franciscan roots. So if we have this form of devotion now, it dates back fundamentally to this event, 1223, with St. Francis of Assisi. So that's what we're going to look at at the first part, the memory of the child born in Bethlehem. And we're just going to read what Thomas of Celano says about it. So, 1223, in this year, St. Francis of Assisi was particularly inspired on, from on high to celebrate Christmas in a special way. And he had a friend called Signor Giovanni, uh, a nobleman who was also a benefactor of the friars, and he told him this, Signor Giovanni, go with haste there, Greccio the place where it was going to take place, and probably prepare what I'm going to tell you. I wish to celebrate the memory of the child who is born in Bethlehem. That's important, the memory of the child. We're going to go into that. And I want to contemplate in some way, with my own eyes, what he suffered in his incapacity as a child, 
how he was reclined on the manger, and later was placed on hay between the ox and the donkey with my own eyes. He wanted to see St. Francis. So the day comes, and at last the saint of God arrived, and seeing that all things were properly placed, he contemplated them and was overjoyed. The manger is prepared, the hay is brought in, and the ox and ass are let in. There, simplicity receives honor, poverty is exalted, humility is valued, and Grecho is converted into a new Bethlehem. So, the saint of God is standing before the manger, overflowing with sighs, filled with overwhelming piety, melting in ineffable, ineffable bliss. The solemn rite of the Mass is celebrated over the manger, and the priest enjoys a most singular consolation. Then the saint of God, during the Mass, he was a deacon, he sings the Holy Gospel. Later, he preaches to the people attending, and as much as when he speaks of the nativity of the poor king, as well as the small village of Bethlehem, he expresses words that are felt as honey. When he would call him child of Bethlehem, or Jesus, he spoke as if he was tasting and savoring with his palate the very sweetness of these words. The gifts of the Almighty are multiplied there. A virtuous man has an admirable vision. There was a child that completely absorbed, was reclined over the manger. The scene of God approaches and awakes him from what was like a deep sleep. Nor did this vision differ from the events because through the work of his grace, which acted through his holy servant Francis, so that through the grace of God, the child Jesus was revived in the hearts of many. So the many who participated in this event, right? Because they had forgotten him and was deeply impressed upon their loving memory, this whole event, all right? So having ended the solemn vigil, each one went home full of ineffable joy. So, in short, he calls this benefactor, he prepares everything in Grecho, they celebrate a mass, people come, receive special graces, and everyone, each one, went home full of ineffable joy. Fundamental. Now let's see what Benedict XVI has to say about this event. In one of his general audiences, he talks about this event in particular. And before he goes into it, he goes, he talks about, you know, the, the history of the solemnity of Christmas itself. The liturgy, as we know, is, uh, it revolves around two cycles, right? So in the lit liturgical year, it revolves around Easter and Christmas. So these are the principal mysteries of Christ, Easter and Christmas. And Easter is obviously the focal and the center, but Christmas has its part, and it was consolidated at the 4th century because it took over the Roman feast Sol Invictus, and um, yeah, it, it took definitive form. But anyways, that's just the historical part. Then he says, he goes into it, but the special intense spiritual atmosphere that surrounds Christmas developed in the Middle Ages, thanks to St. Francis of Assisi, who is profoundly in love with the man, Jesus, God with us. So Benedict XVI, after going briefly through the history, attributes to St. Francis of Assisi the development, that intense spiritual atmosphere, atmosphere that surrounds Christmas, because St. Francis had a particular devotion to the mystery of the Incarnation, which gave rise to the famous celebration of Christmas at Grecho, the one that we read, you know, briefly, really quickly. And he says, what motivated the poverello of Assisi was the wish to experience as real, living, and actual the humble grandeur of the event of the child Jesus' birth, and to communicate the joy of it to all. In these words, these words contain Franciscan spirituality, which is 
characteristic of the spirituality of the Franciscans is the love for the sacred humanity of Christ. Franciscans are very concrete. And this is another expression of St. Francis' spirituality. The fact that he wanted to see that event so as to communicate it to all. All right? He goes on to say in his first biography, Thomas of Chilana, the one that we just read, yeah, he um, recounts this uh, night in a lively and moving way, making a crucial contribution to the spreading the most beautiful Christmas tradition, that of the crib. You see how it dates back in its roots, has Franciscan roots. And it's a crucial contribution, Benedict XVI says. Indeed, the night at Greccio restored to Christianity the intensity and beauty of the feast of Christmas and taught the people of God to perceive its most authentic message, its special warmth, and to love and worship what? The humanity of Christ. So it restored meaning. And this is still its role. Those nativity scenes. It reminds us of the true meaning of Christmas. And he goes on to say, This particular approach to Christmas gave the Christian faith a new dimension. What is that? St. Francis, with his crib, highlighted the defenseless love of God, his humanity and his kindness. God manifested himself to humanity in the incarnation of the word to teach people a new way of living and loving. So the eternal word, when St. John calls him the Logos, the word, you know, for not for everyone, you know, the word cannot be comprehended easily, right? The word is elusive. But when God becomes a little child, it's very magnetic, much more easier to grasp. He is defenseless, and it draws people and souls easier to him. The fisher of men knew how to fish. One of his strategies is precisely this. Becoming a child and attracting souls to himself. Now, Chilano relates that on that Christmas night, Francis was granted the grace of a marvelous vision. He saw lying in the manger a tiny child, like we read, right? Who was awakened by Francis' presence. And Chilano adds, nor did this vision differ from the events because through the work of his grace, which acted through his holy servant, Francis, the child Jesus was revived in the hearts of many who had forgotten him and was deeply impressed upon their loving memory. Just remember that because we're going to go into that. We're just going to read this real quick. We'll go into it. So this setting describes in great detail all that Francis's living faith and love for Christ's humanity imparted to the Christian celebration of Christmas. The discovery that God reveals himself in the tender limbs, limbs of the infant Jesus. Thanks to St. Francis, the Christian people were able to perceive that at Christmas, God truly became the Emmanuel, the God with us, from whom no barrier nor any distance can separate us. Thus, in that child, God became close to each one of us, so close that we are able to speak intimately to him and engage in a trusting relationship of deep affection with him, just as we do with any newborn baby. Like we were saying. So in that child, in fact, God love is manifest. God comes without weapons, without force, because he does not want to conquer, so to speak, from the outside, but rather wants to be freely received by the human being. Is the way our Lord works. He gambles on our freedom. He gambles on our freedom. And he wants to be freely received 
Because freedom is the fundamental condition for love. And that's what he looks for. So those who have not understood the mystery of Christmas have not understood the cru crucial element of Christian life. Those who do not welcome Jesus with a child's heart cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is what Francis wished to remind the Christians of his time and of all times until today. Let us pray the Father to grant us that simplicity of heart which recognizes the Lord in the child, just as Francis did in Greccio. Then what Thomas of Celano recounts of referring to the experience of the shepherds on the holy night with regard to those who were present at the event in Greccio might happen to us. Each one went home full of ineffable joy. Okay. So we looked at Thomas of Celano's account really quickly. Benedict XVI's comment on this really quickly. Now let's get into a bit of Franciscan theology. All right? Before the Vatican, before Greccio, what was, I mean, where did this come from? Obvious. The actual event itself. Our Lady. So that's what we're going to go into right now. Merry Christmas. Christmas is Eve. So now, before, I mean, let's ask ourselves, where do we, how do we know about the Christmas story? How in the world do we know about the Christmas story in the first place? So St. Francis wanted to see with his own eyes, to experience what happened to communicate it to all. But first and foremost, there's a fundamental truth behind this. How do we know about Christmas? St. Luke tells us, Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. Our Lady is the source. How do we know about Christmas? Our Lady. This is what it says after the events, right? So, the birth of Christ, shepherds, the angels. Then Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. And this is very important. So St. Francis wanted to revive that memory, the memory of the child born in Bethlehem. What was he doing? He was imitating Our Lady. That was a Marian disposition and attitude. Pope Francis says, okay, in Evangelii Gaudium, the believer is essentially one who remembers. Who remembers. Memory is important. Memory is essential for faith, Pope Francis says, as water is for a plant. A plant without water cannot stay alive and bear fruit, nor can faith unless it drinks deeply of the memory of all that the Lord has done for us. He wanted, St. Francis wanted, the memory of the child of born in Bethlehem. Another expression of faith. A Christian with no memory is not a true Christian, Pope Francis says. He is a Christian in the middle of the road, a man or a woman prisoner of the moment who does not know how to treasure his history, how to read it and live it as history of salvation. Now to exercise this Christian memory, no other model, perfect model do we have than the Blessed Virgin Mary. Again, St. Luke says, Mary treasured, treasured all these things, all these words, pondered them in her heart. That's how she was able to read it and live it. This is what St. John Paul II says. Mary's contemplation, her 
remembering. It's above all a remembering. But it's just not any type of remembering. We need to understand this word, he says, in the biblical sense of remembrance. Zakar. That is the word. And when this term is used, it means it makes present the works brought about by God in the history of salvation. So what does that mean? It means that the memories of God's work is not simply an archive stored in, uh, you know, the stored away. They are living memories in which we can participate in. A remembrance in the biblical sense. This is what Our Lady did. And what happened? When you remember in the way Our Lady did, Zakar, it makes things happen. And this is what happens. In the Vulgate, five words. Fiat mi secundum verbum tuum. Be it done unto me according to thy word. What happened after those words? Et verbum caro factum est. And this is what St. Bonaventure calls the Marian mode of the Incarnation. Now, that sets the tone for everything else. Because Marian, once the mode of the Incarnation is Marian, everything else that our Lord does has a Marian character. Because the instrument was the sacred humanity of Christ, which he took from the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And this is where the recreation begins once again. We are recreated in Christ, St. Paul says. And let's look at that real briefly, all right? So at Incarnatus says the Spiritus Sancto, Ex Maria Virgine. This is what we profess. We profess that Marian mode of incarnation. I don't know if you guys went into this in your sacred scripture studies, Genesis. Did you, did you look at this? The creation? Probably not. All right. So real quickly. So through the incarnation, we are, it begins the recreation of humanity, right? Because we are um, elevated to divine filiation, to be children of God. Now let's go back to Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I'm not going to go into it too much. I just want to point out, this is how it happened. So, in the first day, God created day and night. Second, sky and sea, land and vegetation. What's the logic behind this? The logic is simply this. He was preparing everything for the children of God. So the first day, there's time. So sky and sea. The third day, he puts life in th that space. The fourth day, he, he uh, creates sun and moon, which are the rulers over time. They, they measure time, right? The fifth day, he creates the birds and fishes to occupy that space. And then the sixth day, the humans and animals that are the highest form of life. And finally, the Sabbath covenant with creation. So the point here is simply this. He was preparing all of creation in view of the covenant, which, which fundamentally means relationship with God. All right? So, I mean, that's simply that. Now look at John. The prologue of John. In the beginning, God was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and all things came into being through Him. 
So in Genesis, in the beginning, God creates ex nihilo from nothing with his word. John tells us that it was through this word, the eternal word. And now look at St. Paul. But when the fullness of time, time, all right, so the creation, time, and now the fullness of time had come. God sent his son, born of a woman. So space. So God enters space in the fullness of time. Born under the law in order to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. Supernatural life. You see how in Genesis, the creation reaches its fullest meaning in the incarnation? I don't know if that makes sense. So in Genesis, he sets, you know, he, he uh, prepares the land, and in, with the incarnation, everything takes its full meaning because the fullness of time, the fullness of space born of a woman, and the supernatural life comes from God taking flesh and redeeming humanity. This is where that important principle of salvation comes from. It says, Caro Cardo Salutis, it's from Tertullian. The flesh is the hinge of salvation. This is how our Lord saves us, from and through his humanity. God could not die, but when he took the human flesh and assumed it, he can redeem man. And this is called the redemptive incarnation. And who's in the middle of all this? Always Our Lady, right? Our Lady. So that's why, you know, it's called the redemptive incarnation because he comes to elevate humanity. All right, so now let's go into the Franciscan school. The Franciscan school flips the script, all right? There are fundamentally two schools of thought in the church. Number one, no sin, no incarnation. More the Thomistic and Dominican school. And the Franciscan school is incarnation would have happened, sin or no sin. So this is the Franciscan view of, you know, its answer to why the God-man, cur deus homo. It's, been, uh, it's, uh, it's a question that has been asked for centuries. And it's very important to have the answer to this because God, Christ, is the revealer and the revelation. So answering the why to why God became man helps us understand the meaning of everything. Meaning about God, his nature, and the nature of man. I don't know if this is making sense, but hopefully. So, the Franciscans flip the script and say, the incarnation would have happened, sin or no sin. And this is called the absolute primacy of Christ. And this changes everything. Because now, it's, the incarnation is not conditioned on sin, but it would have happened anyways. Why? Because there is the primacy of charity. So the primacy of charity is fundamental in the Franciscan school. You can see St. Francis of Assisi. This is their answer for everything, the Franciscan school. And these are the two fundamental principles that come from the primacy of charity. Deus caritas est. Bonum est diffusivum sui. So God is love, and goodness always tends to spread. The Franciscan school highlights and emphasizes more so goodness, and charity. 
So for example, the Dominicans tended to highlight more being and truth, while the Franciscans highlight goodness and charity. And this is based on sacred scripture, right? So in the Old, Old Testament, the vision of the Dominicans are, uh, is founded on the revelation of God, right? I am who am, being. While the Franciscan school is more founded on the revelation of God is love. This is the answer, this is the Franciscan answer to everything. So when St. Bonaventure asks, for example, why is God one and three? Why is he one God but three persons? This is St. Bonaventure's answer. Bonum est diffusivum sui. Goodness always tends to spread. And God, as St. Francis says, is the highest good. So the highest good is highly diffusive. So he answers it with bonum est diffusivum sui, which leads back to the primacy of charity. It's probably hard to, um, to follow this, but hopefully it makes sense. So the primacy of charity, con this is the vision of the incarnation that the Franciscans have, all right? So God is three in one because he is the supreme good. It overflows, and within his life, it overflows. Bonum est diffusivum sui. And it leads to the word becoming flesh. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense. It's hard to uh, follow. Is it, is it making sense? Probably not. Not a whole lot. Yeah. Yeah. Also, I think it's referring to if you love someone and love is not returned, and in, in the incarnation, in loving, love was returned. And that's what the freedom is about. Yeah. You're free to love God, but you're free to love him in return for his love. Exactly. And that's to prove of his love to become incarnate. Right. And we're free to choose to love the incarnate word. Exactly. And look, it changes your whole vision. It changes everything. It right. changes everything. Take an example, okay? Let's just take an example of uh, St. Alphonsus de Liguri. He, was, he loved Our Lady. All, I mean, he was one of the greatest Marian doctors, okay? But he su subscribed to the first school, which meant that no sin, no incarnation. So he the Marian doctor, goes and reaches the point of saying, if there was no sin, there would be no Mary. Isn't that crazy? But that happened because he subscribed to the first school of thought. That's the Franciscan revolution right there. Does the sun revolve around the earth? Or does the earth revolve around the sun? Are we made for Christ? Or is Christ made for us? Does the dog wag the tail? Or, the, or does the, the tail wag the dog? It changes a whole lot. And this is the Franciscan vision. The primacy of Christ. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yes. That Mary was conceived in the mind of God from the very beginning. Of right. Mary. So that's more Franciscan. <laughs> exactly. So another point is the Franciscan school always go back to the mind of God, his original plan. All right? So in, uh, in Ephabilis Deus, Pius IX's bull on the Immaculate Conception, he says this. The Blessed Virgin Mary was predestined from all eternity uno iudemque decreto with the one and same decree of the word incarnate. 
So in the mind of God, they are inseparable. They are inseparable for all eternity. Does that make sense? And this is Mary of Agrita's vision as well, because she's Franciscan. Interestingly enough, I mean, you can subscribe to this or not, she says, Adam and Eve physically look exactly the same as Jesus and Mary. The new Adam and Eve. I don't know if that makes sense. So any other questions? Christ was going to enter into humanity, yeah. and that's why the, um, some of the angels revolted, because they would not accept Our Lady, and probably they couldn't understand why the Son of God would take on hu you know, human form. But, th but that, would that also be like the mind of God? He was always exactly. going to enter into creation, um, but his role became then um, he died for our sins, and to heal that big wound that was caused by, that humanity um, caused or when Adam and Eve sinned and put themselves first. Right, the theologians talk about that, how the test of the angels consisted in accepting the mystery of the Blessed Virgin Mary in the incarnate word. They could not conceive how they can uh, submit themselves to someone, to a, a merely human person, the mother of God, who was elevated to that rank, right? That's why their sin was fundamentally of pride. Yeah. Is there another, any other questions? Because I don't know if this is making sense. It's really hard to follow. But it's very important. Yeah. I think it's easy to get caught up in um, the other because, because of the fall. Mm -hmm. So, but you have to go before that. Exactly. So God would have come down from heaven regardless of if there was the sin of Adam and Eve. So, but, so there, the Dominicans are taking it. I don't want to, I mean, the Dominicans, I'm kind of like shadow boxing right now. If the <laughs> Dominicans were here, I don't know what they would say. Well, but, I, you know, generally, that's their school of thought, right? Right. So I think, so, so we don't want to forget and lose sight of the fact that God would have come down exactly. to dwell with us regardless of if there was a fall. Exactly. That's why the incarnation now is called redemptive incarnation. But if there was no sin, it would have been a glorious incarnation. But it would have happened regardless. Mm -hmm. Now think about it from a philosophical level, all right? They say, omnis agens agit propter finem. Everyone acts for an end in mind. Now God is absolutely perfect. And now if God acted with that end in mind, conditioned by sin, does not that admit an imperfection in God? But if he, the perfect, perfect being, had Christ as the end in mind, does not that elevate him all the more? That's why John, John Duns Scotus calls the incarnation sumum opus Dei, the greatest work of God. And if the greatest work of God is conditioned by sin, doesn't that kind of ruin his work? I mean, does that make sense? Any other questions? Sorry, this is kind of hard to, uh, to digest, but I mean, I know I'll try to simplify it. All right, let's keep going. Just finish this up. All right? So, and the Word was made flesh, and this does not and should not leave us indifferent. That's why St. Paul says, the love of Christ urges us on. You see how charity makes everything go round? That's why Fulton Sheen uses a beautiful expression. 
um, he says, Love makes the world go round and brings it back to its ultimate source. So it begins and ends in that way. And a, and a beautiful expression of this is Dante, who was a tertiary, Franciscan tertiary. He ends his, his masterpiece in that way, with the words, um, how does he end it? Uh, the love that moves the star and moon. So love makes go the world go round. This is the Franciscan vision of everything. This is St. Alphonsus' famous picture, all right? So with the Franciscan vision, if you want, it, if you want to understand it in, in a simple image, this is it. This is it. Our Lord takes flesh, the fisher of men, to fish for human hearts. So the defenseless love of God is the bait to get human hearts. So with the Franciscan vision of primacy of charity, the incarnation is depicted in this way. He does, he does come to save us from our sin, but that is not the primary motive. He wishes to draw us to himself. And this is really the Christmas atmosphere, right? When you see, um, when you, this is the charity of Christ, uh, if you know it or not, there's that, there's that Christmas atmosphere. You know, even if you don't believe in the incarnation, isn't that true? Is that still true here? I don't know. In the Philippines, is very sensible, the Christmas atmosphere. I don't know if in North America, it's like that still, but it's not like that anymore. Not like that. Okay. Not like that anymore. It's all about shopping. So, Deus Caritas Est. Everything has its origin in God's love. Everything is shaped by it. Everything is directed towards it. This is the greatest gift to humanity. And, it all, and, and this is what St. John says, right? Which uh, synthesizes everything that we talked about. St. Francis wanted to see. He wanted to remember that memory. And St. John says, we declare to you what, we, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. And this life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with Christ, with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So this is the Franciscan experience wants to see it, experience it, to communicate it with others. And this is the Christmas joy and spirit that has to permeate the season. And let's end in this way. And this is where it all started, in Bethlehem. Chesterton says that the Christmas story is built upon a paradox, that the homeless God who came in this world should be celebrated in every home. And it should be that way. And the manger that was rooted in St. Francis' experience reminds us of that. Amen. Ave Maria. Sorry about that. I mean, that was pretty hard to, uh, that was pretty hard to, uh, to digest, I know. Any question? Yes. There you go, there you go, Fra Roger. With regard to what you were talking about, about yeah. um, the incarnation, yeah. if, any, if you just go back and read yeah. The Mystical City of God towards the beginning, I don't remember it's an, it's exactly it is, yeah. where it is, it's very clear. Wait. It's very clear how it all... So I, I'm going to do the, the, the devil's advocate right now. Can I do that? Sure. Can I do that? Can I do that? Sure. All right. Now, you do whatever you want. all right, so you're saying that, that's fine, that's fine, but remember, 
Remember that Mary of Agrida was Franciscan. Now, is that supposed to prejudice me? Yes, now I'm going to explain why. The theologians say that even in private revelations, the principle that we t always talked about, quid quid recipitur ad modum recipientis recipitur, applies. So, what does that mean? Mary of Agrida, being Franciscan, had that vision. Now, if you look at like Anne Catherine Emmerich, who was not Franciscan, does not hold that position. One okay. point for me, zero for you. <laughs> and just because... Just, I mean, just I, be I agree with you. Just because Mary is Franciscan, that invalidates my point. No, I mean, um, they could argue that... that that's what he's saying, right? I, 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 I know I'm not as smart as you. I'm trying to keep up with this. But, um, no, I'm saying they could say... Right, I understand. Right. Oh, exactly. No, but no, 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 no. See, I don't, I don't know that that... I, can we prove that? I Look at Anne Catherine Emery. I don't believe that because, because that wasn't all proven. That whole theory yeah. wasn't fleshed out until Blessed John Duns Scotus, and I thought he came after her. I think he was before Mary of Agrina. Okay, all right. There all you right, go. That, I mean, I agree with you, Nick. Okay. But, you know, okay. I'm just doing the devil's advocate okay. right now. All right. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, my, I mean, look at other, um, uh, other mystics who are not Franciscan, and interestingly, interestingly enough, they don't talk about the absolute primacy of Christ, just like Mary of Agrita did. Check it out. It's the fact. Well, the, in, and I, I, you correct me if I'm wrong, it, I believe in the Christmas Mass, there's, there's a reading where, or it's not a reading, it's a... Felix Culpa? Yeah, yeah, where's, yeah Easter, where's Easter. Necessary fall, or, oh, happy fall. All right, cinematic. I'm going to do the devil's right. advocate right now for you. Sorry? All right. Go ahead. Finish up. And well, that was, so I was just so that's that's part of the mass. Definitely. Lex orandi, lex credendi. Completely right. So the law of our prayer reflects the law of what we believe, right? Fundamental. Now I'm gonna answer as a Franciscan now. All right, because you you're bringing up the Dominican perspective, and now I'm gonna be the devil's advocate with great joy because I'm a Franciscan. Now, when the liturgy talks about Felix culpa, oh, happy fault, it says, oh, happy fault, because it gained for us a redeemer. Attenzione. Redeemer. What does that mean? The primary motive of the incarnation does not apply there. There is the sin, there is the Redeemer. One point for me, zero for you. <laughs> Who's next? Come on, Ed. I'm ready. Let's do this. So, I'm just getting started. Okay, if, if the primacy of Christ isn't true, then why didn't God just suddenly appear? Why did he have What's to that? have a mother and a father? Why did he have to have a mother? Why didn't he just appear? It's God's idea. That's his plan from all eternity. I'm, I'm asking you, though, yeah. to prove the primacy of Christ. Yeah. God came into the world in a perfect way, was through a mother. Right. To look at it the other way, yeah. he could have came and suddenly appeared. Right, but that wasn't, that wasn't uh, how providence uh, worked out. Yeah. I'm talking about the difference between... The Dominicans, Dominicans yeah. Well, don't tell the Dominicans now, because uh, they're going to... I love Father Pat. The, the Dominican ideologies, to me, would say that Christ could have came. But look, you guys are free to hold either school. But what is... I'm asking you now. What is more beautiful? The Franciscan school of thought? That everything was made in view of Christ and Mary? Or St. Thomas's school of thought where no sin, no Mary. We're on, the, we're on the same team, Ed. We're on the same team. No, no. no I, I we're wanna, on the same team. I want to go back to our original argument because he, 
he just he just proved it. Okay. So okay, so we go back to Mystical City of God and that whole segment where it's all described as to what happens. Yes. Well, then I agree with Ed. So I and that's what I've always said when I'm explaining that to people. God could have sent Christ to Earth any way he wanted. He could have right. sent him in a spaceship, he could have appeared, uh, landed in a meteor, yeah. any old way he could have sent him. But he didn't. He chose to send him through Mary, physically, through her body, thereby creating her as the conduit for grace to come to earth. And that, that, and that, is, and that proves the point that it goes back to exactly what is in the mystical city of God because that's how it's set up. All right. Okay, I went. One point, one point, <laughs> one point. But you gotta, you gotta remember, we're on the same team, Nick. We're on the same team. No, okay, all right, okay. Got it. And, but, all right. And, and also, yeah. why God is Franciscan, because, I'm gonna, his, you know, telling the, um, all the angels that Jesus was going to take on human form yeah. and have a mother, that was the test for the angels. Exactly. And they rejected her. So that proves God is Franciscan because that was part of his plan. <laughs> whoa, whoa. That, that was the angel's test. <laughs> that was the angel's <laughs> test. Okay. Third one, All right. It. Yep. So with that comment, should we wrap up right now? <laughs> All right, hold on. Just, uh, just an announcement right now? Yeah, let me, throw, let me just throw one more plug in. Okay. okay. <laughs> Office of Readings, yeah, there's a second reading letter from Saint Leo the Great Pope. It explains all. Yeah. Okay. All right. And, and it doesn't use the phrase the absolute primacy of Christ, but you can't see it in there. Read it again. You'll see it. Francis <laughs> It's it's in Ephesians, Saint Paul's Ephesians. It's all there. You know, I think we should do one on the primacy of Christ because it's it's a it's a whole gold mine. It's a gold mine. But anyways, God is Franciscan. I don't, I don't really agree with that, but all right. So we should wrap up, all right? In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Ave Maria, Merry Christmas.